Hello, welcome to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I'm a postdoctoral scientist at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle, and I will be your host for this web series. Now, the purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize, and for scientists, that prize is the Nobel Prize. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to treat diseases. Today, we will be examining the 1976 prize in physiology or medicine, which was awarded to Baruch S. Blumberg and D. Carlton Gajasek. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Blumberg and Gajasek the award, quote, for their discoveries concerning new mechanisms for the origin and dissemination of infectious diseases, unquote. We'll be focusing today just on Blumberg's research, and we'll return to Gajasek's work in a later episode. Blumberg's main discovery was the identification of the hepatitis B virus. We'll be going over the unusual research route that led Blumberg to the hepatitis B virus, the discovery of a link between hepatitis B and liver cancer, the development of a highly effective vaccine for the prevention of hepatitis B, and some of the strategies currently being developed to cure chronic hepatitis B virus infections. But first, a little bit of background on Blumberg. Baruch S. Blumberg was born in 1925 in New York City. His father was a lawyer, and growing up, the importance of education was impressed upon him. Blumberg attended a Jewish parochial school on Long Island before attending Far Rockaway High School in the borough of Queens, New York. When World War II broke out, he joined the Navy at 17 and was sent to complete a physics degree at Union College in upstate New York. However, while he was there, he realized that he didn't have a talent for physics, so after finishing his bachelor's degree, he enrolled in medical school at Columbia University. He earned his MD in 1951, and after completing his residency training, he decided to pursue a scientific career and enrolled in a doctoral program at Oxford University, England, where he graduated with his doctorate in biochemistry in 1957. During his medical and scientific education, he had a case of wanderlust, and he took many opportunities to travel abroad. He spent part of his residency in Suriname and part of his doctoral work traveling in Africa and East Asia. After finishing his doctoral degree, he accepted an offer to start his own lab at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. He stayed at the NIH until 1964 when he moved his lab to the Institute for Cancer Research in Philadelphia, which later became the Fox Chase Cancer Center. It was here that he would make his Nobel Prize winning discovery of the hepatitis B virus. Now, you might be wondering why we're talking about hepatitis B virus before talking about hepatitis A virus. The main reason is that a Nobel Prize was not awarded for the discovery of hepatitis A virus, but another reason is that hepatitis B virus was actually discovered first. In fact, there are five known human hepatitis viruses, which are called hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. But the order of discovery of the hepatitis viruses was B-A-D-C-E. I know, what the heck, right? To make things even more confusing, the hepatitis viruses are all extremely different from each other. A and E are transmitted in contaminated food and water, while B, C, and D are bloodborne pathogens. None of them belong to the same family of viruses. B has a DNA genome, while the others have RNA genomes, and their genome sequences differ a great deal one from the other. And once they infect a cell, the viruses utilize very different replication strategies. HBV replication is particularly odd because although the virus has a DNA genome, it replicates by reverse transcription of RNA to DNA. But despite their extreme molecular differences, the hepatitis viruses all have one thing in common. They cause hepatitis. The word hepatitis is a fusion of the word hepatic and the suffix itis. Hepatic means related to the liver, and the suffix itis means inflammation. So hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver. The liver is one of the largest organs in your body, and it performs a wide range of over 500 vital functions that help keep you alive. 
Some of these functions include regulating serum proteins, production of chemicals that help digest food, and detoxifying the blood. When a person develops hepatitis, liver function is impaired and the person may become sick. The most distinctive clinical feature of hepatitis is a condition called jaundice. Jaundice is a yellowing of the whites of the eyes and often includes yellowing of the skin. In addition to jaundice, hepatitis patients can develop fever, fatigue, and abdominal pain. Severe liver damage due to hepatitis can become life-threatening on some occasions. These symptoms of hepatitis were noticed by clinicians as far back as ancient Greece, though they didn't know what caused them. But with the expansion of the field of microbiology in the first part of the 20th century, physicians began to suspect that microorganisms might be responsible for hepatitis cases. As epidemiologists began to study hepatitis outbreaks, patterns emerged that suggested hepatitis was caused by an infectious agent. But the patterns of infection weren't always the same. Sometimes the pattern suggested that hepatitis was caused by contaminated water, such as when everyone who developed hepatitis had drunk from the same well. Other times, the pattern suggested that hepatitis was caused by a bloodborne pathogen, such as when people who received serum therapy developed hepatitis. The spread of hepatitis through sera was particularly interesting because the disease spread through sera even after bacteria had been filtered out. This led scientists to suspect that hepatitis was caused by a viral pathogen. By the late 1940s, the existence of two separate hepatitis viruses had been theorized, one that was spread orally in contaminated food and drinking water, and a second that was a bloodborne pathogen. The hypothetical oral virus was dubbed the hepatitis A virus, while the hypothetical bloodborne virus was dubbed the hepatitis B virus. During the next two decades, many virologists were on the hunt to identify the suspected hep A and hep B viruses. They were all surprised when a group of people who were not hepatitis researchers, not virologists, and not even infectious disease scientists, announced in 1967 that they had identified the hepatitis B virus. That group was Baruch Blumberg's team at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. So what was the research that led Blumberg to the hepatitis B virus? Well, it was very serendipitous. Blumberg worked in a scientific discipline that, by his own account, is difficult to characterize, but nowadays we would call it something like biomedical anthropology. In Blumberg's words, the main question driving this field is, quote, how do inheritance, human behavior, and the environment interrelate in the context of disease, unquote. Let's take malaria as an example to see how inheritance, human behavior, and the environment can impact the course of a disease outbreak. Malaria is caused by an infection with the parasite Plasmodium falciparum. We covered this in episode 3 of this podcast. However, beyond that immediate cause of disease, the parasite, there are environmental factors such as geography that affect who ends up getting malaria. Malaria is spread to people by mosquito bites, so people living in areas with few mosquitoes rarely get malaria. Human behavior also impacts who gets malaria. People who sleep under mosquito nets at night are less likely to get malaria than people who sleep out in the open. Finally, inherited differences in populations, also known as genetic factors, also determine who gets sick from malaria. There are mutations in the hemoglobin beta gene that can protect against the development of severe disease in people who get infected with the malaria parasite. So beyond the immediate cause of getting infected with malaria parasites, there are genetic traits, human behaviors, and environmental factors that impact how malaria outbreaks occur. The role of the biomedical anthropologist is to identify what those factors might be. Blumberg was especially interested in the role of human biological diversity in disease outcomes. Growing up in New York and during his time in the Navy, he was regularly exposed to the great diversity that exists between and within human populations. During his time as a medical student and resident, he had often wondered how this diversity affected the course of a disease. Early biomedical anthropologists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries had wondered the same thing, 
they had looked at easily identifiable biological traits, such as height, weight, age, sex, and skin color, to see if these traits could inform the outcome of human diseases. But during his time at Oxford, Blumberg was exposed to the new frontier of inherited biochemical traits. So in addition to obvious traits, such as hair color and sex, scientists were beginning to identify molecular differences between people. The first of these biochemical traits to be classified was the ABO blood types, the discovery of which was worth its own Nobel Prize. The different blood types of A, B, AB, and O represent different inherited molecular differences in the ABO gene. When biomedical anthropologists learned about this new type of human biological diversity, they realized they could treat differences in genes the same way they had treated differences in height, weight, sex, or age. They asked whether differences in a person's inherited biochemical traits, like their blood type, might also play a role in or help predict disease outcomes. The differences in the ABO blood types were keeping scientists busy, but Blumberg wanted more. He wanted to know how diversity in other genes affected disease outcomes. Each of your cells has about 30,000 genes, so that's a lot of opportunity for variation. Blumberg decided to set out on a discovery mission to identify new variation of people's genes with the eventual goal of maybe finding a gene variant associated with disease. But how could he identify differences in genes between one person and another? Well, nowadays if we want to examine genetic diversity, we can easily sequence DNA from people in a population. But back in the early 1960s, DNA sequencing was still in its infancy. So rather than looking at variation at the level of DNA, Blumberg and his team decided to look at variation in proteins, which are the functional outputs of genes. He specifically decided to look at variation in blood proteins, since blood is one of the easier tissues to collect. But how could they identify differences between proteins? Well, a new technique had been developed not long before Blumberg started his own lab that used sera donated from patients who had received blood transfusions to probe variation in blood proteins. The principle underlying this technique was that a person receiving a blood transfusion would develop an antibody response against protein variants in the donated blood that the person receiving the transfusion did not have. So think of the blood donation kind of like a vaccine or immunization. If a person received a transfusion from a blood donor that had a different version of a sera protein from the recipient, then the recipient would develop an immune response against that protein variant. Blumberg and his team could use these antibodies against the variant as a probe to test how many people in a population had that version of the protein. If that method doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. The bottom line is that they had a way to look for different proteins in people's blood, and they went on a discovery mission to look for novel protein variants. Blumberg's team traveled all over the globe collecting blood from diverse populations, and once they had their samples, they screened their panel of sera to see if any of the antibodies could identify unique proteins in the blood. One of their first hits was in line with what they had expected. They found that lipoproteins in the blood had identifiable inherited variants, and that some of these variants put people at a higher risk for things like cardiovascular disease. It was a cool result that was a small precursor to a lot of great studies that are going on now to try and understand genetic contributions to cardiovascular disease. But while they continued their work on lipoproteins, in 1964, they started up a side project examining another protein in the blood that was a little more perplexing. The protein was originally discovered in the blood of an Australian Aboriginal, so they called the protein AU. However, they soon found the protein was in blood from people all over the world. A series of events and observations over the course of nearly a decade eventually showed that the AU protein was coming from the hepatitis B virus. At first, the team suspected that AU was a new variant of some inherited gene. Their initial studies showed clustering of AU-positive individuals within families, which is, you know, what you would expect if a gene is inherited. 
However, the data didn't quite match what one would expect for the inherited trait. It was off sometimes. Sometimes there were people who were positive for AU whose parents were both negative. Additionally, a rather high proportion of AU positive sera came from blood transfusion patients, suggesting they might be dealing with a bloodborne pathogen. Furthermore, Blumberg's team would sometimes collect blood from the same person multiple times over the course of many months or years. In a small number of cases, they observed people who had previously tested negative for the AU protein convert to becoming AU positive, which raised the possibility that they had somehow acquired AU. In another study, they observed that AU was significantly more common in institutions where large numbers of people were housed together, specifically they looked at mental asylums. This suggested that AU was spread horizontally from person to person, much like a pathogen. None of these findings demonstrated conclusively that AU was coming from a virus, but taken together, the observations were highly suggestive. Since most serum proteins are produced by the liver, the group wanted to test the hypothesis that AU was associated with liver disease. This is what led them to look for a link between AU and hepatitis. In 1966, one patient who was receiving regular blood draws converted from AU negative to AU positive. Blumberg's team checked the patient and found that they had indeed developed hepatitis after becoming AU positive. One year later, in 1967, a second incident of hepatitis occurred, this time in one of Blumberg's own lab members. After developing hepatitis, the lab member checked to see if she was positive for AU, Sure enough, her blood had converted from AU negative to AU positive. These incidents were enough to convince the team to do a wider study. They went back and checked their sera samples for AU positive individuals and checked how many of them also had hepatitis. They found a significantly higher frequency of patients with acute hepatitis were also AU positive. Blumberg's team was now pretty sure, based on their epidemiological data, that they had identified the long-sought-for hepatitis B virus. But they had arrived at their result accidentally, and without having done any actual virology. When they tried to publish their initial results linking AU to viral hepatitis, the paper was rejected for this very reason. They needed more proof to show that AU really was linked to a virus. In 1968, Blumberg sent blood with the AU protein to Manfred Bayer, who also worked at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Bayer had a powerful electron microscope, and he used it to check for viruses in the fraction of blood containing the AU protein. He observed that the blood contained virus-like particles, though interestingly the particles didn't contain nucleic acids like DNA or RNA. In 1970, a separate group in England again used an electron microscope to check a different fraction of AU-positive blood for the virus, and this time they found virus particles both with and without the viral nucleic acid. This was solid proof for the discovery of the hepatitis B virus. The discovery launched a flood of new research, clinical trials, and drug development. The Nobel Assembly took notice, and in 1976, Baruch S. Blumberg was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Once the hepatitis B virus was identified, people began to better characterize the spread of the virus and the clinical outcomes of infection. By surveying populations around the world, it became clear that hep B was a global disease, though it was more common in certain areas than others. Hep B is especially prevalent in Africa, East Asia, and Pacific Islands. The surveys also revealed that hep B is an extremely common disease. In fact, about one-third of the world's population is estimated to have had hepatitis B. Most of these cases are mild or asymptomatic, and the body clears the virus without issue. But in about 5-10% to of cases, the body fails to clear the virus, and the person becomes chronically infected with hepatitis B. It is estimated that about 300 million people globally have a chronic HBV infection. Most of the people living with chronic hep B don't have visible symptoms. However, they are at a much higher risk of developing liver problems later in life, especially liver cancer and cirrhosis or scarring of the liver. 
Chronic Hep B is estimated to account for approximately 60% of liver cancer cases and over 700,000 deaths globally from liver disease every year. Wow. After realizing just how big a problem hepatitis B really was, Blumberg and other scientists began looking for ways to prevent the disease. One of the easiest ways to prevent an infectious disease is to stop transmission. HBV is spread by contact with contaminated bodily fluids from an infected individual. Infected individuals have high amounts of virus in their blood, though the virus is also found in other bodily fluids at lower amounts. Most cases of hepatitis B are infants who catch the virus from their mother in the weeks shortly after birth, but the virus can also be transmitted sexually and through needle sharing among users of injectable drugs. Back in the 1960s, patients who required large numbers of blood transfusions were also at high risk of developing hepatitis B. One of the first steps Blumberg and his colleagues took after discovering HBV was to start screening blood donated to hospitals in Philadelphia for the presence of hepatitis B. By removing the HBV-positive blood, the hospitals saw cases of post-transfusion hepatitis drop from 18% to 6%, a significant drop. By 1972, it was standard practice in the U.S. to test blood donors for hepatitis B. It's estimated that this simple act prevented approximately 40,000 cases of hepatitis per year in the U.S., and post-transfusion hep B is no longer an issue in countries that screen for the virus. After ensuring the safety of America's blood banks, Blumberg and his team focused on the creation of a vaccine against hepatitis B virus, and they had a rather novel way of producing one. Remember earlier we said that under the electron microscope, they had observed virus-like particles that did not have the virus genome? Well, Blumberg's team realized that these particles would make a great vaccine candidate since they carried the viral proteins, but the particles did not infect cells. After developing a way to purify the non-infectious particles from patients' blood, Blumberg's team approached the pharmaceutical company Merck and asked them to help set up a clinical trial of their vaccine. Merck agreed to run the trial, and the results were published in 1980 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The vaccine was astonishingly 95% effective at preventing hepatitis B disease. And importantly, the vaccine also prevented the development of chronic hepatitis B, even in infants who are at the highest risk of developing chronic hep B. The FDA approved the HPV vaccine within two years of the paper's publication, and it was put to good use. A new method of purifying the HPV vaccine from yeast greatly reduced the effort in manufacturing the vaccine, and pharmaceutical companies were able to produce billions of doses in short order. Forty years since its initial release, the HPV vaccine is one of the most widely used vaccines in the world. It has been shown to be remarkably safe and effective and seems to provide vaccinated individuals with lifelong immunity. Thanks to the vaccine, New cases of HPV have been declining globally, and so have cases of HPV-linked liver cancer. A spokesman for the World Health Organization said in the year 2000, quote, The vaccine prevention of liver cancer is now considered to be one of the two most important cancer control programs, exceeded only by the worldwide smoking intervention projects, unquote. The current vaccination recommendation by the U.S. CDC is that everyone get the three-dose HBV vaccine as an infant during the first year of life, when the risk of developing chronic HBV is greatest. You can also get the vaccine as an adult if you so wish to. It's hoped that as more countries adopt HBV vaccine programs, chronic hep B cases will continue to decline, and maybe in the long run we might be able to eliminate hep B entirely. Unfortunately, the eradication of Hep B by vaccination is complicated by the fact that Hep B can become a chronic infection, and there are currently over 300 million people who are HPV carriers. While vaccination is extremely effective at preventing people from developing chronic Hep B, the vaccines can't do anything for a person who already has a chronic HPV infection. There are drugs effective at suppressing HPV in people who are chronically infected, but much like with people with HIV infections, the drugs typically do not eliminate the virus, and virus levels in the blood rebound if a person stops taking their medication. Curing people of chronic Hep B infections remains a major goal in the scientific community. 
It's also something that I have developed a personal interest in since starting my new postdoc position in Dr. Keith Jerome's lab at the Fred Hudge Cancer Center. So the lab I'm in now focuses on persistent virus infections, including hepatitis B, to achieve a functional cure for HPV infections, the lab is using gene editing technology to directly target viral genomes in infected cells. So why would we want to use gene therapy as a strategy to cure Hep B? Well, the current antiviral drugs do not effectively clear the HPV DNA from infected cells. This means a template for making new virus persists inside the cell even in the presence of antiviral drugs. But since gene therapy can directly target viral DNA, in theory, it can be used to permanently shut down virus production. I'm excited to be working in a lab that brings my interest in virology and gene therapy together, and I hope to be able to share some cool research results soon, so keep an eye out. Okay, that concludes this 20th episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on August 10th, 2023. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music, and thanks to Nicholas Wynn for doing the graphic design for the logo. Next time, we'll be continuing to talk about viruses, and we'll see that the discovery of HAV and HBV viruses wasn't the end of the story for viral hepatitis. After scientists began to get control of HBV infections, they realized that another, previously unknown hepatitis virus was still out there, and it was still spreading, and it was still killing. The discovery of this new hepatitis virus would earn another Nobel Prize and start the hunt for a vaccine that has not yet been completed. Want to know more? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.